So, Renato, did Trump get yet another crazy break in the New York civil fraud case? Eh, it's complicated. I'm Renato Mariotti. I'm a former federal prosecutor, a practicing lawyer, and a legal analyst. And I'm Asha Rangappa. I teach national security law at Yale University. I'm a former FBI special agent, and I'm a legal contributor for ABC News. And we're here to help you understand topics that can't be boiled down into a soundbite or a tweet. So, Asha, it was a pretty big day uh, yesterday in New York. Um, Quite a lot going on in court. Obviously, we had, as we just referenced a minute ago, the Court of Appeals decision uh, regarding the size and timing of the bond uh, for Donald Trump in the uh, civil fraud case brought by the Attorney General. There was also uh, a hearing in the Manhattan DA case that was pretty consequential as well. Yeah, so I was pretty depressed after I heard the news from the appeals court. Um, It just feels like, I mean, maybe, maybe this would be true for any defendant. And of course, it is an unusually large judgment. But still, it's sort of like... It just feels like he gets breaks and gets treated differently than I think an ordinary defendant, but maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. Okay. Yeah. I don't think it's worthy of being depressed about. All right. I'll be, I'll be the cheery person here. Oh, you're not sad, sad panda this week. I'm not sad panda. No, I'm happy. I'm sad panda. I'm sad panda. Oh my goodness. Okay. Yeah. I've had my lucky charms this morning, uh, or cocoa, cocoa pebbles. Uh, so I'm happy. Um, All right. So first of all, first of all, uh, just, you know, paying one hundred and seventy five million dollars, which is, I think, the new bond amount uh, is still a lot of money to pay in a bond. Okay, it's a massive bond, first of all. Second of all, Donald Trump um, was facing a, a case, a significant case that I think it's fair to say, like businesses have typically not faced. Um, now, sure, was he doing things that were, uh, to use Asha's term, shady? Uh, perhaps, yes. Uh, clearly, that's what Judge Egeron found. And yes, uh, when you run, run for president, become president, you get more attention on your activities. And so, um, you know, it's understandable that that's going to draw scrutiny from regulators and so forth. True. Um, but at the same time, I mean, the amounts that were calculated – by Judge Egeron were high. And there are cert- I'm not a New York lawyer. I'm a California and Illinois lawyer in terms of my license. But friends of mine that are kind of closer to New York state law told me that, you know, some of his calculation, for example, the disgor- full, disgorging the full amount of a transaction uh, is not entirely, um, um, you know, it, it was something that there there could be a dispute about. Let's put it that way. So it very well may be the case that the Court of Appeals made a decision that they might be looking at um, some aspects of that amount on appeal. And accordingly, it did not make sense to ask Trump to set aside, given the size of this, this is not a $100,000 bond, this is hundreds of millions of dollars in bond, to set aside hundreds of millions of dollars for aspects of the judgment that may not actually hold up on appeal. Yeah. So to recap, he had, because I just want to understand procedurally what this means. He had to post the bond in order to, he could still appeal, but if he were not able to post a bond, AG James could have begun enforcement proceedings. So by posting the bond, he stays, it stays the enforcement part of that um, against the judgment. But I'll also note that the order from the appellate court also stayed several other parts of judging Goran's order. So it wasn't only related to the money damages. It also stayed, I, I don't have all the provisions in front of me, but, you know, the prohibition on serving on corporate boards. And uh, I think some of the restitution that some of the other players had to make, et cetera, et cetera. 
I think the only thing that that was left in place was the babysitter, the compliance monitor. Right, uh, Judge Jones. Right. Yeah. Um, so I, I I hear you. I mean, I think what it suggests to me is that the appellate court um, is going to take a really close look at this on appeal, and they did not want to have a situation where they end up crafting different remedies here ultimately, and. Uh, essentially because the appellate process takes a long time that you had a situation where the judge's um, determination regarding remedies would have a, an impact that would be very disproportionate on an entity. And obviously uh, in a case where there's going to be a lot of attention, like I said, I, I'm, this is me obviously reading tea leaves. I'm not a New York lawyer. I'm putting that out there. Uh, a and B, I certainly don't sit on an appellate court in New York. So I don't know what they're thinking or what's in their minds. But that is my best guess here. Is it possible that they're also saying, for, for example, for the bond amount, there's an element of it in which they say, well, posting $175 million is enough to ensure that even if we're at $200 million or 250 or whatever, that that's going to ensure um, or provide substantial assurance that the the people of the state of New York are going to get their money. Sure. I think that's possibly an element, but I, I do think that they're, you know, my read on this, if this was my client is that, well, this, this makes our chances on at least modifying this on appeal uh, look a little bit better. Yeah. It's just, it feels like in every possible forum where there is, you know, some possibility of accountability, something happens. Well, that, I, I, I hear you with that. And this, and, and I'm only saying that because I feel like this one has been the one that I have been, I think, an outlier and saying, hey, you know, I know we're really focused on the criminal cases and they're important. And, but in, you know, I think personally, realistically, I don't think we're going to ever see Trump in an orange jumpsuit. And so I always thought that, you know, holding him financially accountable and hitting him in the pocketbook would actually be possibly more, um, I don't want to say meaningful to him, but I mean, it, it would, I think he, he, that matters to him um, more than anything. And now it almost feels like even that is not going to be as powerful as you know, what I had anticipated. Yeah. I mean, I think for Trump, you know, you, one thing you said is like, there's always seems to be something that comes up that helps him out. Some of those things are like totally uh, problematic and blameworthy. And we should get very concerned about or upset about like some of the stuff we discussed with judge Cannon last week. Okay. Where there's a criminal case for outrageous conduct, clearly unlawful, clearly criminal conduct. And, you know, it sure looks like the judge is, you know, making some very uh, certainly questionable, but also it appears some, some pro, you know, problematic, wrongful decisions in the, but in other matters, like, you know, we're, we're going to talk in a moment about the Manhattan DA's case. I think it's fair to say that case would not have been brought, right? Uh, unless it was Donald Trump. And, that case, um, you know, he's being treated like whatever, you know, like a, any other defendant, uh, I think would be if they were making accusations about the DA and wanting more time and more discovery. So I, I don't really that, you know, there or in this case, I mean, I don't know exactly what the Court of Appeals is going to say about this, but I, I don't I, I haven't seen anything about the state court system in New York that makes me think that Donald Trump is getting some amazing break here. Um, the state courts in New York have been, I would say, pretty tough on Donald Trump. Uh, and Judge Egeron, despite a lot of pressure, issued an, an opinion. Um, and I, I'm in a wait and see mode regarding what the appellate courts in New York have to say about it. Um, if they end up deciding that only some of those restrictions apply and he only ends up paying a hundred and something million dollars, um, that's still a very substantial penalty. And for most of my clients, that would be just absolutely devastating to them, uh, including large companies would just find that to be an awful thing that would be very much discussed and very concerning and a bet the company kind of moment for them. So I think 
just from a certain perspective that Trump is facing something very significant there still. Well, I think that he has, what, 10 days to come up with this new $175 million bond. So we'll see. I mean, he claims he has that much cash just lying around under his mattresses. So maybe this one won't be a problem. But, you know, if this is also a challenge, then, you know, it could be difficult for him to to post this one as well. We will see. And by the way, you know, he, one source of cash he does have is this new, was it Trump social uh, deal that he's got going oh. on, which I'm sure is um, sending up the, I think, well, Asha, is it the red flaggy? Is that what you? Uh, is yep. That, red flaggy is one of my is words. That, is that the Asha term? It is. So uh, there's a lot of questions being raised about that, valid questions that are being raised. So uh, stay tuned on that front. But let's turn to the Manhattan DA's case. You know, a lot of people like, you know, you said, oh, Trump gets away with this and that. Uh, it appears that Trump is going to be facing a criminal trial in Manhattan in like 20 something days. Right. I mean, it's very short in the middle of April. Uh, he's going to be in court four days a week. I think they take one day off so the judge can keep the rest of his cases going. Uh, but that seems pretty consequential to me. Yeah, I think it's consequential. I think also. It's interesting whether Bragg will be able to really show that it's consequential, right? To make the case that this really fits into the overall election interference bucket. And I know that I've been hearing like different ways of characterizing this case. And I think that there is an attempt to move away from this idea that it's, you know, a hush money case and more towards, you know, voter deception or election interference. And I think that that's the key that is going to need to stick. And I'm talking about in the public sphere, obviously, for but maybe also for the jury. I don't know, like for the jury to really care and be like, why do you have a former president here that you're talking about business records? Yeah, I do think it's going to matter for the jury, Asha, because Jurors, at the end of the day, they need to feel good about the verdict that they're rendering. Okay, so this is somebody's tried a lot of cases, and part of what you do on the in the prosecution side is you want to make sure that the jury understands that this is a serious matter, this is a serious crime, and it can be a challenge when you essentially have a technical offense. Okay, like you know, in other words, you're trying to ask the jury to find someone guilty of a felony because they didn't fill out some form. <laughs> They didn't do this or that. You have to explain to the jury, give them a rationale for why it matters, right? Why does it matter that you file your taxes, um, you know, file your tax return? Or why does it matter that you don't reenter the United States if you've been deported without permission or whatever the technical, more of a technical offense might be, right? Why is it important that we use FDA regulated devices if you're a medical provider? In this case, I do, you know, at the core, the, 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 Charges are about false statements in business records. And, you know, Trump's defense is going to be, I have no idea what they're putting in the records. I just knew that we were making some payments. I didn't know about that, right? That's going to be the trial. And it's going to be up to Bragg to sort of turn this into something more than that. And so I do think it's, uh, I do think what you just said matters. Um, and I will just, uh, but I will just say, I mean, However, this turns out one way or the other, and I think his, I do think Trump's chances aren't awesome in a Manhattan courtroom, um, you know, state courtroom. Um, th you know, there's definitely going to be a lot, uh, 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 you know, a lot of fireworks, but it sure looks like from the hearing this week, Asha, I really think the judge is going to make him go to trial. He had absolutely no patience for the allegations of governmental misconduct, of prosecutorial misconduct thought those were unfounded. He thought there was no basis for that. And, you know, they really, the defense did not do what I expected, which, you know, what I expected them to do is to pull out some of those documents from the Southern District of New York and say, judge, this particular document is so vital. I now need to interview three different witnesses about it. I, mm -hmm. I need to do all mm -hmm. this stuff to buy some time. They did not really do that. And that's, that's what it would have taken, I think, to get a delay. And so, I mean, this is on. I mean, this is happening. And it's going to shape, I think, the presidential election this year. Yeah, it's on like Donkey Kong. 
So here's my question on, because I think it's a, an interesting defense of like, that you and I talked about, uh, you know, on our, on our own, that Trump could say, yeah, I know I reimbursed Cohen, but I had no idea how they structured the business. Like, that's not my thing. Like, you know, I wasn't, I, whatever. Like I, I just instructed the company to, to reimburse him. Um, and I do think there's a hole in that argument as it is, because obviously if, you know, you're having Michael Cohen pay and then you're trying to reimburse, you're already evincing an intent to not make it look like it's coming from you. But having said that, I assume that you also have to show the intention to actually engage in the business, the specific business fraud that's being alleged. And so my question is, is there a way for any of the evidence that was presented in the New York civil fraud trial to come in, like the te the deposition testimony? Because it does seem like this was also one of the defenses that was sort of floated in that case. And what the attorney general, you know, the case that she made is no, like everything, the buck kind of stopped with Trump and he knew what was going on. Like this wasn't just, you know, his accountants and his financial CFO, like doing whatever um, that he knew. And I think at some point he, I think because his ego wouldn't let him admit otherwise, he more or less conceded that he knows everything that's going on in the company. Yeah, that's a great question. And because that's really the fault line here. I don't think that enough people are focused on that and what that looks like. I do think, you know, the fact that Trump signed a check to Cohen, he's going to say, well, yeah, I thought I was paying Cohen. I didn't know that these were being recorded as false statements in the books and records of the right. Trump organization. You really think that I spend my time going through, the, you know, internal or, you know, corporation financial records. Um, so, yeah, I think that will be the fault line. And the answer is yes, they can use Trump's testimony, whether or not he testifies. Um, and because those are statements of a party opponent, he's the defendant. Those are essentially admissions, so they can just put those statements in. Um, documents, it really depends on whether or not they've been produced in this case. But don't those incriminate him? I mean, does does he... Isn't bringing him, even if it's his own words, in a separate case where he was unable to invoke... I guess he could have invoked the fifth, but yeah, he could have invoked the fifth. He could have. And that's the trick bag that the government often puts you in. Uh, yeah. What the government will do is they'll investigate you for an SEC civil violation and a criminal violation at the same time. But they won't charge you in the criminal violation. They'll, they'll charge you with the civil one first. And then mm -hmm. you have this, you're in this trick bag. Do I plead guilty? Or excuse me, do I, um, do I take the fifth? If I take the fifth, then they can't they can't use it against me in the criminal case, but I'm screwed in the civil case. Or uh, do I testify, in which case they can use it against me? So yes, I have used statements in other in in when I was a federal prosecutor, statements uh, in a prior proceeding. Um, and we didn't identify the prior proceeding, but you just say, "Yep, there was you gave sworn testimony in a prior proceeding, and this is what it was," and so on. So yes, they can and they will uh, if they want to, if there's something beneficial there. Documents, evidence is tougher, okay? Because there, it's got to have been produced in this case and they have to essentially appropriate notice of, it has to be given that that's going to be used. You can't just sort of, there's so many ex sheets of paper that, out there, okay? That you could potentially use a trial, but they need to say, you know, we're sending this piece of paper from the AG's case to you because, you know, we believe that's evidence. And then when they when the exhibit lists are due, whenever that is, X number of days before trial, you need to list stuff as an exhibit. Can you get away with adding exhibits for trial? Yes, but there's limits on that. And judges, uh, you know, it's one thing to say, oh, there's one exhibit that came up because of something that occurred in the middle of trial. It's another thing to say, here's 100 exhibits or here's 50 exhibits. So you have to you pretty much the, the idea is that the defense is on on notice and understands what the case is against them, which, of course, by the way, is what they're complaining about now. They're claiming that all of the or they claim this week, right, that all the federal uh, production of documents was uh, unfair. Yeah, it will be interesting. And. I guess 
again, now my sad panda worry is back that like, this is not as slam dunk as I think it, it has been made out to be, you know, I mean, in some ways it's a slam dunk in the sense of, you know, the, the actual falsification of the records. But I think in terms of what the bar is for Bragg to show that Trump specifically knew about it and, and intended it to be structured in, in that way in order to conceal it for the commission of this other, you know, crime to deceive voters or whatever. That seems like a pretty high bar. Yeah, I, 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 I think we've all, you and I have always believed that this was the weakest of the criminal cases that Trump faced. Um, I think that it's, there's definitely challenges in ter- that the Manhattan DA has in terms of proving this one up. I do think that they'll meet that burden. I mean, I think there's sufficient evidence on that. And like I said, the um, jurisdiction helps them on this. In my opinion, I think you always consider the jury pool. I don't think a Manhattan jury overall will be um, beneficial to Trump. That said, you only need one person on the jury uh, who really likes Trump uh, to potentially hang the jury. So does he have a chance? Yes. Does spending six weeks in the middle of a pre- general election campaign in a in a Manhattan courtroom uh, benefit him? I'm not. I don't know. I'm not a political analyst, uh, but I assume it doesn't. Uh, it's a safe assumption, I think. Um, and so it's going to be consequential one way or the other. And I think it will be something that all of us will be talking a lot more about in the weeks to come. So, Asha, today we had another big development, a a development that actually is going to impact the lives of millions of people across the United States. Um, And this was the Supreme Court oral argument over over Mifepristone, uh, what people call the abortion pill. Um, It seemed like at a high level, the justices were skeptical um, about this effort to restrict access. Yeah, I was only following the oral argument on Twitter by the people who were actually listening to it, but I did have to prep the case for, to talk about with, with ABC. Um, and you know, the, the facts are a little complex, but as you said, I think the the issues are pretty, uh, straightforward. So mefepristone is actually a part of a two drug regimen. Um, it's not the morning after pill. It's a, it's a separate, um, prescription drug that essentially induces an abortion. And what's going on here is that in 2000, the FDA approved mifepristone for this use. Um, Life goes on. Then in 2016, the FDA, under something called the Risk Evaluation and Mitigation Strategies, REMS, the FDA allowed mifepristone to be used up to 10 weeks into a pregnancy, uh, up from seven weeks, which is what it originally was. Then in 2021, uh, during COVID, the FDA relaxed some some other, like under the REMS procedures, I guess, also relaxed restrictions that required in-person visits. Uh, and to, in order to obtain this prescription. So because of telehealth, uh, you know, people were allowed to, um, you know, get, visit their doctor, not in person, and then also have it, um, have it mailed to them. Um, so they didn't have to have it dispensed in person either. And so this is one of these cases that um, a newly formed organization, the Alliance for Hippocratic Medicine, which was formed after Dobbs, um, you know, coincidentally in Amarillo, Texas, um, brings <laughs> a file suit. Um, it lands in front of a particular judge, Judge Kismarek, um, who is known to be very conservative, anti-abortion. Um, I think we've had several other cases that have landed in front of him that have gone up. It's sort of this feeder judge, though there's now been some procedural changes that might change that. That's right. I mean, this is something we discussed 
and we discussed I think this with I think with Steve Vladek, who's been a guest yes. on our podcast before, where he, essentially if you file a case in a particular jurisdiction like Amarillo, Texas, you can be sure of which judge you get just based on the number of judges in these sort of more remote or less populated locations. And so um, people, there's a judge shopping going on and it's becoming a bit of an issue. Yeah, let's come back to that at the end because I think the judicial conference is trying to take some some action on that. But in any case, he gets this and basically he says, I won't go through the whole initial thing, but basically he says the FDA got it wrong in 2000. Um, you know, this, this should never have been approved. This is harmful. I guess he, I don't know, put on some lab coat and became a doctor um, and decided this. And then he also uh, accepted the plaintiff's claims that this was a dangerous drug and said that these expansions that took place in 2016 and 2020 were also um, not valid. And basically, the his original claim that, you know, this shouldn't have been approved um, was th- that had the statute of limitations, I think, had exceed has run in order to challenge that. So that's not what is at issue here. What's at issue are these other changes that were made in 2016, 2021, that basically expanded the access and allows this to be uh, attained through the mail. And this is really key because, um, you know, the mail order prescriptions account for the majority of abortions nationwide. And so through a bunch of different procedural, you know, uh, stages, this has reached the Supreme Court. And basically, there were two big issues that the court was concerned with. So the first is standing. Um, as I mentioned, this organization, which was formed after Dobbs, is ostensibly comprised of physicians and, I don't know, according to some of the Twitter commentators, like dentists or something. But anyway, they are alleging, they brought this suit alleging that they are harmed by the FDA's actions because their patients could be prescribed this medication and it could, it could harm them. So it's like these unnamed patients that they have some injury into the future. And we can talk a little bit about span standing and injury and speculative harms, but that's like one issue. The other issue, this was really interesting to me is that judge Kasmark's opinion centered also on something called the Comstock act, which is an 1873 law that was brought by kind of a moral zealot who wanted to like stop the sale of pornography and contraceptives. But in in this law, there is a prohibition on uh, sending anything that can cause an abortion through the mail. Now, apparently, you know, in the last century and a half, the Comstock Act, which is still on the books, has been understood to not include lawful things that, you know, including drugs prescribed by physicians. But the idea, I think, by this conservative group was to basically use that as the vehicle to say, you can't send this through the mail, it's illegal, which would then, by the way, mean that even in states where abortion is legal, you would not be able to obtain the drug. And even more than that, if if the statute were read even more broadly because it doesn't only specify drugs, it's anything, then supplies, equipment, anything used to, uh, you know, perform abortions could theoretically be banned as well. So those were the two big issues. And kind of I was looking for commentators uh, to relay what the court was saying about those two things. Yeah, I will say, you know, there's definitely been a move to take this, I would say, partial abortion ban, in other words, a ban on abortion in certain states, red states, et cetera, and expand it nationwide. I mean, Trump has made this or is making the 16-week nationwide ban part of his presidential campaign. There are some people who literally are trying to spin that as moderate in some way. It's not moderate if you're a woman 
who lives in Michigan, who cares about the autonomy of her body, okay, uh, and would have that change. But nonetheless, this is essentially an attempt to restrict access. It matters a lot because in rural areas in particular, it can be very challenging to find a service provider who's going to, a healthcare provider who's going to provide reproductive services. And in some of these states, you'll have an entire state where there's like one person who actually provides the service. So it could mean, you know, driving hundreds and hundreds of miles. And this is the only practical way if you're working two jobs to try to make ends meet where you could potentially have access to an abortion. Yeah. And from what I can understand, there was a lot of time spent on this standing issue. Um, and basically with the justices trying to identify exactly what the injury is. So do you want to talk a little bit about that, about injury and the harm? I mean, it sounds like basically where the, where the doctors claim that they were suffering like an injury of conscious, conscience. Yeah. Is very bizarre. I mean, we and we had talked, I think, maybe a little bit about it when this first came out in the in the district court. But yeah, I mean, it's sort of bizarre. The the reason that you have loss civil lawsuits, the whole purpose of them is that someone who is there's an actual case or controversy. In other words, an actual dispute amongst people, not like the you just asking the Supreme Court to give their thoughts or their advice advice or guidance, but an actual dispute, and where one person or or entity has been injured. And ultimately, um, they're trying to make that that injury whole. And by the way, that per there needs to be some venue in a, whatever jurisdiction that you're filing your lawsuit. And so, as you suggested, there's this group that just happened to spring up after you know you you, uh, you said Dobbs. That's the decision that out that overturned Roe versus Wade. Happened to form an Amarillo of a some random healthcare providers, and their injury is. Essentially, that ha being in a, a, a circumstance where they might have to prescribe this, right? No, or I don't even think it was that they're being, nobody's being, it's that their patients might be, what I understood it as, their patients might be harmed um, if, I guess, another doctor prescribes it to them. And, you know, the, these patients are under their care. So let's say I'm seeing my gastrointestinologist and he, you know, I'm under his care and he's really concerned because I, you know, some other doctor might prescribe me mifepristone and that could result in complications that then makes, you know, that hurts his feelings or, or, or makes his job harder or something like that. That's yeah. what I understood it to be. That's, that's pretty out there. That's pretty remote. Well, uh, when... it's remote and you know, I think, imagine the implications of that, because if you were to allow that, then it's hard to see why, what would stop any doctor or dentist from challenging the safety of literally any drug. I mean, right? Right. And the justices today seem very skeptical of that. And I will note that that was not the first time that they have. There have been a number of, of challenges in the lead up to this. A lot of people were looking at other challenges uh, to FDA approvals of drugs and the justices have always been very skeptical um, and their view is like the FDA has got the expertise and they could take a long view on this. And so I, I don't think the oral argument today is surprising, but it sure sounded like some of the justices, including justices that were appointed, for example, by Donald Trump, were very um uh, skeptical of the idea that they should be trying to figure out whether a particular drug is safe or not. Yeah. I mean, I think except for Thomas and Alito, um, of course, I think another interesting thing on the standing issue was the solicitor general pointed out that to whatever extent these people are claiming a harm and particularly a harm to their con conscience or something, because they object to, abortion they're suing the fda and the fda is not causing that harm because standing also requires not only that you suffer an injury but that there's a cause you know there's a causal relation between the you know i can't if somebody else hurts me like i can't come sue you renato 
I mean, you have nothing to do with it. And so you can imagine like the FDA, remember the challenge here is to their expansion of access, which seems quite tangentially connected to whatever harm these people um, have suffered. Yeah, you know, I will say it's really something that this case has gotten all the way up to the right? United States Supreme Court. Right? It's it's weird. Yeah, there's a lot of people who have all sorts of ideas, like fanciful ideas of lawsuits they want to file. I get people approaching me constantly, and usually there's a bazillion problems with them. Uh, and it's interesting. Here they not only brought the lawsuit – and got funding, by the way, to bring, I mean, they're paying, they got yeah. fancy lawyers to bring this lawsuit. And then uh, they, they got a district judge to go along with this. The Fifth Circuit uh, has not, I, you know, has, has, you know, gotten us to this point. Now here, they didn't put a stop to it. Uh, here we are in the United States Supreme Court. Well, Renato, it looks like, by the way, that the Judicial Conference, which is the body that oversees procedure and, you know, the way that cases work in the federal court system have caught on to this whole judge shopping scam. And in early March, I think they they made some changes to how cases are assigned. So even if you're a newly formed group in Amarillo, Texas, where there's one judge and you decide to bring a, a case, I think now it's maybe like there's a broad, bigger pool of judges to whom it could be randomly assigned. So it could still go to the Amarillo judge, but it doesn't de facto. And then you're taking a risk because it could go to a a very different judge than than you really want, um, who could issue a bench slap to your poop pot claim. So. Yeah, that seems like a good change. Look, we have judges, federal judges are very busy. And they've got a lot on their plate. We don't want to have litigants overloading one particular judge in order to obtain a result. Like it's just from a pure management perspective, you could see where the courts are taking a look at this because you don't want litigants to be picking their judge. The whole point is that judges, the judge assignment is random essentially so that this way – Everyone gets, um, you know, not only get everyone gets a fair uh, hearing in front of a judge, but also uh, the work is spread out evenly amongst the many, many hundreds of judges throughout the country. So, Renato, before we go, last week I made some key disclosures about my past. (laughs) <laughs> that may or may not come up if I ever go for a Senate confirmation hearing. Oh, God. But you said at the end, you said your high school life was, was very different than mine. And I said, we should talk about it this week. So what you got for me? Okay. Uh, well, when I was in high school, uh, first of all, I looked very different. I weighed almost 300 pounds at the time. I had glasses. I was like nerdy. Uh, I just, that was just my whole vibe at that time. I was the captain of the debate team. I was an editor in my school newspaper. Uh, Very into that. Captain of the Scholastic Bowl team. I mean, that is about as nerdy as it gets, I think. Uh, I was on the math team for a year or two, and they were like, too nerdy for me. Like I just couldn't, uh, I, so I didn't really get that invested in that, but I was like, so I was pretty nerdy. And was the uh, math team like, were they like all Indian kids? (laughs) Uh, There's a lot of, I was definitely, but (laughs) yes, I was definitely, that's fair to say. I mean, in my, uh, yes, a lot of, a lot of South and East Asian. I was just curious because I was the only Indian person in my high school. So I, Oh, really? Mm -hmm. So where I grew up, there's lots and lots of, because there's a lot of engine, like a a lot of engineering folks uh, in the area, like, because there's a lot of um, technology companies that were, that were headquartered here. Bell, there's a Bell Labs um, uh, um, headquarters or something that was here. So we had a lot of, uh, a lot of South and East Asian folks. So they were, they were basically, I was one of the only white dudes 
in the oh, uh, in the interesting. Math team. Oh wow. Yeah, I yeah. tried to get my kids to join the math team. My son refused, but I forced my daughter to do it. So I got dragged into it. Like, you really should. Your your scores fit. And I was just like, I did it a, like one year or something. And like I just but that is like that when it's new too nerdy for me in high school, like that's really saying something. But you have to call yourself a mathlete. Oh my God. Okay. I was, by the way, I got because for like Scholastic Bowl, that was technically a sport. It was like an IHSA, whatever. Did you get uh, a letter? I got a letter for <laughs> Scholastic Bowl. And, and and a lot of the, the nerdy people were on both the math team and the Scholastic Bowl team, but all the hyper nerds preferred the math team. And so like when we had like a regional championship one year, I was just me and like one other person and we couldn't even field the full team for classic ball. And I would just like buzz in immediately to give the other side no time to come up with <laughs> their answers. Was Cause I was strategy. just like, well, it's just me. There's no discussion. There's no, we're just, just jumping in every time and guessing. Um, and so it worked. Uh, but in any event, um, yeah. So like that was sort of my high school experience. My, and I like, I did you go to like, prom? I did go to prom with a friend, not with somebody I was dating. My parents were also like super conservative, like evangelical Christian types. And so like oh, there was that right. whole element too. Yeah. Yeah. It was very, very uh, different. Um, so I was not a, you're a cheer, cheerleader. I was not like at all cool. I was not having fun and sneaking around. And so then college was like, so it was very different, right? College was like an experience where I actually got to whatever, get out there and do stuff uh, a little bit more than high school. Did you go wild in college? I didn't go wild, which is why I was able to go to law school and do all of that stuff. <laughs> I But I got, la I got less nerdy, maybe more normal, sort of. For University of Chicago. I got normal for University of Chicago because like the entire student body got more nerdy. And I got a little less, so I kind of fit into the mainstream. Whereas oh, is Chicago too, like a nerdy school? That's not how I think about it. It was at the time. And oh. so at the time, the, the, the motto, like they sold these t-shirts at University of Chicago at the time that said, University of Chicago, where fun goes to die. Um, that was their <laughs> tagline. And they were very proud of themselves. There was like a list of top party schools like they ranked all the schools they sent partying and like university of chicago was 300 out of 300 like the like the oh last my god place. so there would also were t-shirts where you could get that and like that was so at the time that was a point of pride and when i was there the school was very concerned because they were slipping in the u.s news whatever rankings and so they were making all these adjustments to get like normal charismatic fun students there and when i went back to be the mock trial coach Years later, when I was a federal prosecutor, the students were like way different. They were like way more charismatic and fun and attractive. And like, I'm like, who are these people? They're not University of Chicago students. Uh, so it was definitely a, a shift. Interesting. So then you became cool. I don't know when that happened. And that may have been when I was, a, I, I don't think I became, I don't think I ever really became cool. I'm still kind of, I'm you're still cool. kind of lame, right? No, you're cool. Okay. I'll take it. You're officially cool. Thank you. Do you think Trump made you cool? Because you like, it, like you ended up talking on TV. I, one thing I will say is like, I was somebody who really transformed in the years that I was a federal prosecutor. Mm. Like that job changed my entire personality. Mm. I became much more aggressive, more hardline. I really... I had a lot of stuff go on during that time, like brushes with death and all of this. And so I mm. was like, it got much harder as a person during that time. I also got in great shape and just kind of can't, became more of an adult during that time. So that was like huge for me. Like if you saw me when I was a young associate at a law firm, I was kind of like the nerdy guy writing everyone's briefs. Uh, you know what I mean? I was like the guy writing the appellate brief and then it changed. At some point in time. Now I don't write I don't write briefs anymore. I'm totally know. seeing your biopic now. Like the transformation that happens. I, I would would Jonah Hill pay, pay me my younger years, maybe? Maybe. Early and, Jonah Hill. Now he's like he's slimmed down and in great shape, right? Right. And then who? Like Ben Affleck? 
Okay. I'll take that's great. Uh, can I get Batman, Ben Affleck? Ben yeah. Affleck, I think, looked the best, and he's Batman. Yeah, I mean, I, I think he's always cute, actually. But oh wow, okay, well, yeah. so does J Lo agrees? Yes. <laughs> M-S-W-Media.